Well, thanks very much, Emily. Um, I'm going to keep this very short because I think we all want to hear about the panelists and not about me. Um, but I will introduce Emily to the PEN, which is an organization, a student organization at the University of Pennsylvania that brings together um, students from across the university. It was founded in 2019 on the premise that there was a lot of climate interest, but it was very siloed in each of the schools. And climate is, as we all know, an interdisciplinary problem that's going to require a lot of different skills to be solved. And the idea was to bring all these skills together and to help uh, our members learn and about climate change, learn about the different facets of it, uh, climate sustainability, and um, help them basically get into climate careers and excel um, in those careers. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Emily and Venture Cafe for uh, holding us uh, today in this awesome space and with their awesome hybrid system. So thanks very much. Um, if you want to find out more about uh, Venture Cafe, then definitely reach out to Emily. And I'm going to hand over to our moderator and host for tonight, which is Steve uh, Greenspan, uh, which I met two weeks ago, and I'm very excited that I accept him to moderate this for us. Uh, Steve is a social scientist and former vice president of a Fortune 500 IT software company. In addition to his environmental justice work, Steve advises two startups in the IT industry and is working with an economist modeling food and nutrition security. He also is a lead member of the Power Climate Justice and Jobs Team. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, this, I hope this will be a very exciting discussion um, around um, the role of um, a green tech in changing the world. Um, and I'm honored to be able to introduce the panel today. Um, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Um, very briefly, but before we do that, I want you to give them a feeling of who's in the audience. So um, just raise your hand. Are, are there any students here? Okay, great. And uh, for the people uh, online who can't see that, about six people raised their hand. Uh, any uh, climate professionals? So people that work in the uh, uh, climate change or, or green tech industry or government? <laughs> we have some panelists in there. Um, and there were the three panels for the only one to do that. Any entrepreneurs? <laughs> um, I have four people here. Um, and please look around, see who's, who's raising their hand because there's going to be opportunity afterwards for you to network with them. And, um, and lastly, who's thinking about working for a green tech company if they're not already working for one? Great, and about three people in um, in cafe uh, raised their hand. So with that, I'd like to um, shift to the panel. I'm gonna, uh, I'd like each of the panel members to introduce themselves and to say uh, their name, their position, their company name, and also what's the key problem that your company is solving today. So um, why don't we just go in this order? Brian? Yeah, I chose the wrong side to sit on. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I'm Brian Tracy. So I'm the co founder and CEO of a company called Super Brewed Food. Uh, Super Brewed is on a mission to drive better sustainability for global protein nutrition for humans and for animals without compromising the nutritional status for what we're consuming. Great, thank you. I'm Santiago Ramos Carbonell, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Versity. At Versity, we're solving the problem of high cost green hydrogen. We do this by utilizing our new and change memory that allows you to move away from expensive metals that are a limiting factor for the hydrogen user. My name is Erica Nanda, I'm the CEO of Compact Membrane System, and we create membranes to decarbonize industrial processes. The large scale of carbonation. Great, thank you. So, every company and every person is on a journey. Um, every, you know, and I want to do, I want to start off with a discussion about that journey. So, can you briefly tell us um, about um, how you got started as a green entrepreneur or in the green tech industry? Um, uh, Santiago, perhaps 
What, what are the two biggest challenges that you face in, in creating a startup? Very good. I think that my experience in the green industry is that you're facing always a competition versus something that is much cheaper to the great alternative, the alternative that it meets, uh, that creates uh, emissions. So identifying that specific market is identifying the right approach for the right strategy to enter the market in a price competitive way. I think that has been the, the biggest part of but once we have figured it out, it has become the biggest advantage. And what in your background helped you figure that out? Um, my background is in chemical engineering. Uh, I did my PhD in developing catalysts for fuels. Uh, so I understood, I, I came to Berkeley with the understanding of how these electrochemical systems worked and what were the key constraints that exist in them. For example, in the case of electrolyzers, iridium is a key constraint for the scale up. Uh, there's current systems that can generate green hydrogen, but if you're thinking about the carbonizing heavy industry with green hydrogen generated with electrolyzers, there's not enough iridium in the world. So it's kind of like very those two, two parts, understanding that the fundamentals of these systems uh, with a key issue that is reducing the cost of green hydrogen generation. Great, thank you. Um, and Erica, um, transforming the world or trans, um, can seem overwhelming. Uh, there's so much to be done, so much that needs to be done quickly. Mm -hmm. um, how did you choose your area? How did you choose your focus? What was, what was your journey? Yeah. So I would say our my journey happened over time. I came to CMS when it was developing new a technology platform, and the first application of that technology was actually in uh, improving yield and reducing losses in greenhouse gas emissions in the petrochemical industry. Um, and then follow on applications in renewable natural gas and biogas and in carbon capture. And so I think what we needed to do was um, stick with those later two until the rest of the world saw the value of doing things like carbon capture because you know when we were waving that flag five years ago we couldn't get anyone's attention but you know you kind of persist and you say okay it's going to be the we'll prove it as the first one and that's going to be to your point that's kind of the leading edge and then we'll work our way through the system and you just have to believe it um but it's been really great to have come in there enough to see now now i you know get calls from everyone I'm perfect so persistence is a real key yeah. trait there. Mm -hmm. And um, Brian, uh, can you tell us about um, your transformation context around that? Sure. So <clears throat> Superbrew uses a fermentation platform of microorganisms. We apply it all over the area of decarbonization, renewable chemicals, advanced materials, renewable energy, so forth and so on. Our transformational moment was frankly recognizing that Food has a massive input on global sustainability. It also has a major equity component to it, and the big social justice and extending out more access to everybody who possibly can. Combine that with the fact that it's an intimate experience that consumers are really connected with. So, in terms of trying to get consumers to care so much about energy and materials that you're sitting on, that you're walking on, can happen. And I applaud you all for doing this. Mm -hmm. But it is challenging. But we all eat and we feed people ourselves. And so it's much more near and dear to the consumer. And frankly, from that perspective, we've had a much grander opportunity to have faster impact because people pay attention. People pay attention to what they eat and the story behind it. So if we can take an accurate picture and develop the trust and transparency to them. As to why they should make a shift for global benefit, neighborhood benefit, and so forth. It's, in my experience, it's easier to do than trying to get them to care about the part that they're buying. We need that to support. We all need it. Um, so, all of you are working in the Philadelphia, Delaware area. Um, what made you choose this area? And or perhaps it's, it's just that you were here. But what about this area is great for doing a green tech startup? And what can make it better? So let's start with Eric. Sure. So CMS was actually founded in Delaware. Um, 
material scientists coming from DuPont, right? And so Delaware is very much the hub of material science and chemical engineering at the University of Delaware. So from that perspective, it's great. It's a great source of talent. It's a great place to do, you know, fundamental material science work. Um, we would very much capitalize on that. So, so location is really important for, for getting the right people. I absolutely, yeah. the same way. I mean, and then the other thing about um, if you take a look now at the Delaware Philadelphia region, I work on energy. Houston is a you know the energy hub of the U.S. Maybe you can say the energy hub of the world, um, but it's very focused on that that one industry. When you sit here, you can get there's a cross section of talent and people working on different. So you will also see in tech and do a lot of capabilities from across different different areas. So I think that's extremely helpful. <laughs> so do you have the same Absolutely. I think I think I totally have the same feeling as as Erica. Uh, we, we we have been approached by big energy companies in Houston saying Houston is the place to be if you want to make energy. <laughs> but it's really cool what you see in the region. Is that you have a lot of suppliers in the chemical value chain, and that allows you to capitalize on that expertise that already exists in the area, and also you know your company quite rapidly. Also, you can build things smaller, quicker, um, which is super important in startup world. So that has definitely been our experience. And, and you have the same experience. I'm not getting any Houston love. So that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we get it from a lot of other places. But I would just say another addition to the resources and human capital, you have access to 12 to 16 multi-billion dollar multinational corporations that either have the corporate headquarters here, not just incorporated in Delaware, um, or with their North American headquarters major operations here. In particular, we're talking about industries where there's a major capital lift. There's a long timeline in many cases as well to make consequential change. I'm not saying you can't do it against them or without them, but it certainly helps to have their involvement, their participation, and having that regional connection, those intimate conversations at a Bruaha or a Locker Home. There's a big strategic advantage that Silicon Valley and Boston and even Houston don't quite have what we did. That's great. So we have towns and we have smart companies, and we have a great location because of. of in the supply chain. Um, so let's talk about partnerships and open innovation. Um, Eric, when we talked, we talked about open innovation. So um, perhaps you can just explain to everybody what that is and, and say what that means for your company and for others working in this area. Sure. I would say, you know, as a small company and a startup, we're great at a couple of things. One is taking an idea and you know creating a proof of concept and moving that idea from idea to innovation where you know it's got enough around it that you know you can prove that it's going to scale up and then ultimately to a product and that's uh, having a small company that can have the patience to work on that and focus on those things is really valuable right and then you get to scale right but what it's very hard to do from a small company's perspective is have to scale to reach the entire world or in the case of us where we're developing um products that go into very large industrial processes like you know power generation and um in other areas we don't actually have a petrochemical plant or i don't have a, a, a major utility or any of these other big pieces of industry um and so collaborating with folks that do have those things and are looking for technologies to solve problems that they have, they recognize that they would like to you know, do things better than they're doing or do things differently or just do things more efficiently. And so finding those partnerships is absolutely critical to, to scale, to, to reach scale. I had to just build CMS to be DuPont size just to be successful um, or Amazon size just to be successful. That's really, really difficult to do and not a really great use of capital um, but partnering with folks who have those assets and as they're in a transformation of saying how, how are we going to exist in the new world and we have to put perhaps our old business model aside where it needs to be invented in a substantial way and, and Santiago, did, did you encounter what, what's your biggest challenge in dealing with bringing on new partnerships or 
or working with other in the supply chain. We started at first, you know, we're focusing on the memory. The memory is this component that is centered in the electrochemical systems. Um, our tap of memory is disrupted uh, right now in the market. There's another competitive memory that is a product exchange memory ones. So really working with the customers uh, to demonstrate that our technology is really working uh, because there has been a lot of skepticism around this around this specific type of technology. So then really bringing them into the conversation, providing them uh, materials with test, and then hearing them quite often uh, was an integral part of developing those mutual relationships. And then after we cemented those relationships, we cemented the data set that demonstrated that our technology was performing well, not only in our hands, but also in our customers' hands, is what allows us, what is allowing us to expand the business, and uh, going also for like price of development. So, um, if, um, Brian, can you step us through how you formulated the uh, partnership? I mean, once you locate people that you need to work with, uh, how do you pitch that? How do you, how do you make that happen? Yeah, slowly. Uh, so we were I mean, to piggyback on Santiago, the number one challenge I find is just speed. They don't act on the timelines of a startup, which is a major challenge, right? So, but to grease the skates, so to speak, is coming back to the advantage of being in this region, is being able to get in front of face to face with decision holders. So the way we really get going, in my opinion, is you have to be able to navigate the complexity of big organizations to make sure that you're having appropriate conversations with people who can make decisions. Otherwise, you'll spend decades, literally, there's been decades of kind of chatting around people who aren't able to do it before. Right. So how do you how do you get this person with that these decision makers? Really savvy skills on LinkedIn, maybe. But it's networking, to be honest with you. Really networking, developing an advisory board, developing a set of advisors to you personally who know the industry much closer, much better than you do, to make the personal introductions. I mean, not to make it too intimate, but Kelly Ellen Coleman, the past CEO, who would want to hang out in our office and then be able to make a personal phone call to the CEO to make multinational out of the Netherlands, something like that. You have to be able to forge those relationships to be bold enough to go out and do that. And Thankfully, too, I found in this region, people are willing to answer the phone call and they're willing to take a coffee. That's great. Anybody else have a story about how they got to that right person? I think there's also an element of letting go um, and sort of thinking who's going to be a uh, later adapter and who's going to be an early adapter. I mean, all startups are facing a constraint on resources. There's obviously the obvious constraint on money that everyone knows about and team size, but the parallel one is time, you know, and you only got a fixed resource of time to allocate to things. So one of the ways I think about it in conjunction with Ryan is like, okay, so how many darts can we throw out there and how many high quality darts? Absolutely true. The second piece is when you're trying to get information back that you've got a conservative or slow moving or extremely process oriented organization on the other side who's not going to be moving at that, who's positively oriented but doesn't have a mechanism for moving as quickly as you'd like. Okay, that's the later of the adoption curve, right? They're not necessarily or most likely going to be an early adopter, a partner on innovation, the ones who's going to drive that. And you know, then it, it really is having, you know, they're self-selecting into another bucket. And that's fine. Part of what you're doing is trying to sort sort them out. Are you an early adopter? Are you a fast follower? Are you a later follower? And and you gotta be kind of diligent about being willing to make those assessments. And, and in the open space model, mm -hmm. um, you have to work with those partners at innovation as well. You have to be able to mm -hmm. Be flexible, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, did any of you change or reformulate what you were doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just, I think it's a dangerous, it's a slippery slope sometimes, right? You can be driven by opportunity or you can drive an opportunity. So I think at times you still need to be bold enough to drive your opportunity. And if it's not necessarily a good fit with that strategic, there's other strategics out there that you maybe want to continue to invest some effort into finding. 
Right. And to come to come back to build upon what Eric has said, beyond creating your own network, I do think accelerators work. Some accelerators that have developed that ecosystem, which largely you're paying for or you're participating in, not for capital per se, some coaching, but really getting access to a network of the open innovation needs inside the organization to want to find. Because they typically have a funnel of how they meet you and they're able to be distributed to the right business leaders and technology users. So also pursuing those avenues and that will give you bandwidth to maybe entertain greater or strategic simultaneous. But but when you're dealing with the strategic uh, partnership, uh, many of those partners may not have green tech or climate or climate justice as the top priority for their company. That may not be their culture. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? Because so that's an important value to you. And how do you get them to come over to your side? Our experience has been that now nowadays they're starting to care more. But of course, as always, you want to make the economic case for it. So it's finding really that much in which you can make an economic case for a green technology. Uh, that's 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 the approach that we have taken. So you have to have it, you have to you have to start with the economics and you know to lead on how they're doing it. And to the other pieces, they're not monolith, right? An organization of fifty thousand people is made up of you know tens of organ some organizations within that. So part of it is you know. Just because you haven't had success in one place doesn't mean there's not another business unit or another group focused on what they're doing. Makes sense. So, the, uh, have you set any obstacles in that? Or is that it's pretty easy now? You said things are changing. So, perhaps we can talk about um, clean tech 1.0 and 2.0 for a moment. Um, anybody want to define that? <laughs> I mean, I think the problem is there's going to be a three dot. Okay, I mean, right, the winds change, like, they probably rapidly, yeah. right? The corporate structures and corporate leadership changes as well. It shifts and these changes in these organizations. You invest huge amounts of time, a year plus, and then all of a sudden that individual you develop a relationship with or that group, restructuring happens. And they leave the organization or the CEO is talented. Something of this sort of um, and, and that's a major issue, right? So it's how do you create resilience to your model so that it's less um what's the right word? It's, it's less in jeopardy for the changes in the lands of these organizations. So how how do you drive true value creation for these organizations beyond just public perception? So those down to the triple bottom line for organizations, right? That you can deliver value creation in any part of the Okay, and um, so we talked about plant, we, we talked about uh, green tech or clean tech 3.0. Let's just go back for a moment because you said things are changing mm -hmm. from, from what it was 10 years ago, certainly when the large companies were not investing. Yeah. So, how are we finding today's conversation? It's not a big, well, they're definitely directed from the top of the organization. So if you step back and see what's happening, um, you and I we contribute to a system of capital. Um, an institutional investor are putting in an inordinate amount of pressure on large organizations to address this problem and to address it actually, not to address it by writing something in their annual report. And so, and when large companies don't have access to capital, which is the kind of fundamental threat there, they really do have to change their business model. So that's starting to change. So that's a profound difference from it, it's not 10 years ago, five years ago, in a way that people have talked about climate tech. However, also showed a little bit of chaos, right? Because now everyone is trying to change it. And they don't, some do have strategies and plan for how they're going to do this, and some don't. So I think. It creates a lot of opportunity for us, but even more pressure to separate you know, who we're going to work with initially and who probably need a little bit more time to develop a fuller approach. So, something that is really cool about, for example, in the case of the Harry is something new that is happening that is the low cost of renewable electricity that didn't happen in Clinton 1.0. Yeah. Right. 
But that is happening now. Yeah. So it's clearly a paradigm of change that's enabling a lot of different technologies that have a very hard time in the first place. And I would say solar really laid it down for like, you know, 20 years ago, people were like, it's never going to happen. And it's now the cheapest cost of electricity. So, one, you saw kind of hard tech and the only innovation of a physical product and having that manufactured be successful. Right. So now people believe, even if they see that it's a 20 year timeline to do it. And we haven't gotten anywhere near deploying that in the US. But it, it also creates an opportunity because if electricity prices fall, and what they're projecting is falling to, you know, practically marginal zero cost, there's a whole lot of other tech that can drive that. Right, so that's fundamental. It's like batteries for both of the Yeah, exactly. So it's the combination of those. Right, so that's that's the power side. Mm -hmm. What are the other uh, key technologies that you think are going to influence uh, major trends over the next five or ten years? What's going to happen? Mine, his, his. Normally, this is using biology to its advantage to deliver better nutritional solutions mm -hmm. for our consumption. I mean, not to make this about us, I apologize in advance, but Supergroup took an approach of you derive the majority of nutrition off of your microbiome that just decided you. Uh, it's your choice as to what you want to eat it, is what it's going to deliver you. But you can find solutions inside of there that are top shelf nutrition. We can bring that out and we can grow that in a brewing fermentation environment and feed that to you center in the plate. You know the fact that most humans make bad decisions on how they feed their microbiome. So biology, harnessing biology to deliver better solutions, not to deliver an alternative route to the same thing that you're already consuming. It's going to have a really big impact. Food, just in general, food that can move towards cutting out the animal, going to the plant directly, and you say go beyond that even more primitive to that your microbiome. That's going to have, I think, a very significant. Other technologies that I see that will have a, a revolution, and they're actually happening now, is closing the cycle. For a game, for example, the case of making my batteries. Now it's becoming a huge business, capturing those materials and putting them back in the value chain. And of course, that has a very clear environmental impact. But it just makes sense also from the from the economics point of view already has highly concentrated ores or highly concentrated materials that you can just recover and put back in the value chain. And we said the separation space. So I see this from the world of separations that, you know, there's a huge amount of innovation. What we do is you know, doing things with chemistry that we used to do with heat. And with heat, you usually it means burning something to generate all that, right? And so having a completely different way of getting there. So um, you know, I see that happening and come back to your circular point, right? It's not just making stuff and pushing it out there, but making stuff and then <laughs> recycling and reusing that. Um, you know, it's, it's by our innovation, other people's innovation, but it's all around like, the separation and reuse, you know, rather than just the initial production stuff. So the, the models for transforming are thinking because biological models, models, um, uh, models around uh, getting more into the fundamentals, mm -hmm. right? Not just trying to solve the problem through IT and collaboration, but deeply getting into the material mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. as well. Um, any other trends that, that come to mind? I'd say supply chain. I would have said supply chain two years ago, but now we're looking for a different, <laughs> different place for supply chains. Right. Um, so that's an interesting one. Yeah. 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 This has been happening, but I think it should become trendier. Just do more with less. Yeah. I think our greatest path is sustainability and practice existing approaches mm -hmm. for sustainable. We don't need to do it in the way that we're doing it today. We don't need to consume so much. I'm just a building owner of my truck up here. We get into Philadelphia from Bell. Right. So improving things such as public transportation to make it more accessible to everybody and actually utilizing the change in life mindsets of consumers. It's, we can do our think our number one pathway here is sustainability, is to stay where we are and use it more efficiently. Okay, so um, if you are looking at uh, this room, there, there are people who are uh, looking for uh, uh, jobs in this area. Uh, there are people who might have another startup. Um, mm -hmm. They might be on this panel in a year or two. 
So what's your advice to them? How would you uh, what would you tell them to do? You're doing it. First is networking. Yeah. Come to these these types of events, introduce yourself to people in your community who you think you might want to work with, interact with, or develop an intern network out of introductions into other communities. Listen, just listen all around. Uh, we work with a deep Israeli culture. Um, we have Israeli operations as well. Israeli are seldom right, never in doubt. And by the wonderful <laughs> nature that they are, they do a wonderful job of listening, not necessarily doing as instructive per se, but learning that skill set of listening, really comprehending, right? Taking that into consideration as you build with your actions and bring forth your own fresh new ideas. Um, Doing entrepreneurship in clean tech or hard tech is extremely challenging because the iteration cycles are very different when you when you look at it from the perspective of, for example, software. So be extremely strategic into what you invest your efforts in because it's not as easy as just let's release a beta and let's then test it. It's a little bit different. So talk with the people that have done it, network with them, learn from them, um, and yeah, we don't answer that. You will learn, but with the caveat that you, you need to be very strategic in where you put your efforts. I would say this is a great, great time. I mean, this is a great time to jump in and get involved in something that exists now or creating your own. Um, there, there really are tremendous tailwinds right now that weren't here three, five, seven, ten years ago. It is just to add on that, it's like things that are changing too. Uh, who was it? Uh, General and the general catalyst and Andreessen Horowitz and Sequoia are all embracing new venture models too. They're making their fund structures, their fund timeline returns different. It's participating, maintaining later stage participation in their portfolios because our area of clean tech, hard tech, da -da -da, the timeline is not the same software. It's totally different world. And unfortunately, the land of capital has taken a very long time. Raise that to learn from that. I mean, that's actually, I just saw this yesterday. In fact, it's great that they're finally starting to change that mindset of we don't need the types of returns we talked about 10 years. Rather, they recognize too that they exited a lot of their IPO companies too early. They just stayed in the company four years. Mm -hmm. and so the total portfolios as a whole have been structured the way to do this, mm -hmm. which we need to have. So what mode would you have changed, or how could you facilitate that? I think it's just what Brian said, that they got out three years early, they should have let it ride out. <laughs> totally, uh -huh. right? And then there are the folks who can build those capital ladders and so forth as well to have a disproportionate advantage. In the past, it was all information of the big commodity traders and so forth. They had an information advantage against everybody else in order to make this money off the right. thing. These people have a this, they have a tremendous advantage in terms of developing this capital structure in such a way that they can participate at the all the different series in your deployment of large scale capital in terms of the plants, and structure those in a way that they can then capture maximum value overall. But their mindset in the past of 10 years to exit, get their portfolio done and return on their LPs, it never was conducive. So finally realizing this. The other thing you're starting to see is innovation in the model of different funds. So it's not the same fund that's going to carry. It's that you know you're, you connect into the type of capital that you're going to need to scale in right. a physical environment, right? Which is you know infrastructure bills and things like that. Um, and it's a slightly different dynamic and it needs slightly different returns. But sort of marrying all those pieces together, so you're not just putting on the entrepreneur, hey, head out and see what you can do in the world of infrastructure. Um, so what about problems with discovery? I mean, to, to create a business, you've got to decide that there's a problem you want to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your advice to people around that? How do they get to know what the real problems are? Well, it does. Right? You gotta, yeah, you got to read, you got to talk to people, and it has to be big. And it's a, and a fundamental problem that not that the perfect be the enemy of the good on that. Right, that it's such a big problem, you're like, I can't solve the whole thing. No, no one can solve the whole thing. But is there a slice of it that you can change? I mean, can you also do your job as an entrepreneur in your space to bring awareness to what the problem is that you identify? That's the 
that's a really big challenge, but we need to have the education component of it. And actually, social media and whatnot has made it more equitable for people to go out and share that and be able to have a loud voice, right? So once you identify the problem, you have to make others aware of the problem. Yeah. Another thing is connecting the dots. If you can find someone, maybe you can find a partner or another, start a company that is really interested in you succeeding. Uh -huh. And then that way you can have already a chance in the four year old. So thank you very much. Uh, we will have a this part of the discussion, we're going to move on to the next part, which is a QA. So um, we have people online and we have people in the room. Um, and um, I'll call on you in just a moment. Um, but I just want to um, just give some direction to everybody. Um, so um, we'll switch back and forth between online and in the room. Um, Emily's going to help me out here. Um, she'll raise her hand and she's going to have. I'll call on her a lot because she, she will see the questions that are in the chat. So to start off with, uh, you want to Sorry, Hi, I'm Ashley and I am a first year student at Wharton. Um, thank you for being here today on the panel. Um, you spoke a bit about fun lockup periods and the impact that's had on your ability to have teaching capital. Just out of curiosity, this answer may vary given the different industries you play in, but are there any venture capital funds that you feel really get it that you are inspired by that you align to? Because I do feel like there's an element of greenwashing to some extent right now in the industry. And I'm always curious to hear from your side um, who you think is, you know, really what that is true and authentic in the space. I say, yeah, yes. I mean, we're now, you know, in discussions with some who are very focused on energy transition and I would say um, in the hard tech and physical products, and they're putting the teams behind that. So it's not just what are they saying, but do they actually have a team that has experience there? So they bring something to the table, you know, have they put the other pieces together? So I would say there's, there's it's fundamentally yeah, a real shift there. I'll do some real names afterwards. Yeah, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 we'll just write yeah. one thing though. You can look at funds that have been. You know, longer lasting 20, 30 years. Look at those that have participated in this in the clean tech 1.0. A lot of them lost their shirt, right? And see where they're coming back to today. They still have great investment pieces and they've been, they've been hit with the age of sobriety. Right. And I think that there's a lot of good ones out there who are making very sage, not greenwash decisions. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I said, after we talk about the names. Okay, thanks. But there's some good ones out there. Right? Right, and, and actually, thank you. Um, there will be time afterwards to talk to everybody if you want, and uh, and also as, uh, as with the last question, uh, please state your name and, and what the question is. Uh, and any other questions? Yes. And then I'll talk on. Hi, this is George. It's kind of a tangential question. I believe it was Santiago mentioned green and gray. And I've even seen the term blue. So if that's what somebody could explain those terms. Those are the type of hydrogens, the type of hydrogen, the type of way hydrogen is being generated. So regular hydrogen generated from methane, yes, methane reforming is great. You can if you can if you capture the carbon it becomes blue, you can classify green uh, as blue. And then if you generate it from green energy, the upper is a whole the trunks is green. And then there's four coins, for example, the generate from nuclear power, and then there's uh the pink from nuclear power, turquoise from pyrolysis, there's all kinds of uh, all kinds of colors. <laughs> green is what you aspire for, which is supposedly the best in terms of. True sequestration and hopefully doing durable goods or the usage is that you can continue to be captured at minimum consumption and release of emissions elsewhere. I mean, renewable electricity is a real big challenge because so often have to capture it, to process it, to get it to the form of consumption, it's a lot of energy. So, all that work going into that to capture something, you hopefully spend far less getting to the consumption. If you did to like 
20% of what you're ending up getting to use. Screen, something like that. This brown, gray, purples. Yeah. I think uh, this is, I'm Bruce, and, and uh, well, I mentioned that I, get, I always do the feed for the free tech. The number one you know, climate tech is the number one problem is skin. So you guys have discussed it a lot. I don't know if you know what the, is the bigger break point. But I'm going the reverse direction of this. And I'm curious um, about where your company is, your technology, your ideas originated from. Where did, where, did, where did this all terminate and start? It, it went, we went to our clients. <laughs> and I understand that you can do it to you, Peter. You went to it. Okay. Yeah, so I joined the University of Delaware School of Stock from the group that had already developed the Palmer, the Palmer brain and the IMI change in memory. Uh, back when I joined, the scale of the synthesis in the Palmer was 5 grams, 10 grams, something like that. Uh, so I joined when already the technology existed, but it was exactly that challenge. Let's take it from the map into the company. Uh, we were pretty fortunate to have the support from RFI. She's the Department of Energy, very much commercialization focused uh, branch. And we managed to scale up the technology to a point that we have already demonstrated that the customers were getting good feedback from it. And it allowed us to raise the funds for the spin up of the university. So that's the origin of the technology university. We were an existing company when we developed the three technologies that are for decarbonization. And we have 25 people who are slightly past that kind of stage that Santiago was. And so our process is a little bit more structured, which is you know, there's a team of scientists who think you know, they have a cool way of doing something and, and addressing a, a challenge market opportunity. And so we take a little bit more structured approach of you know, how do they think it's going to work? How likely is it that it's going to work? And what's the distinguishing characteristic? Meaning, is it intellectually interesting, but it's not going to be better than each other, or is it like a major step change? And so we the scientists sort of understand they have to come with that on the science side. And then we pair that on the market side and like, is it big enough to have the you know view be worth the time? But but your company started um, in close association with the top. Well, it started by people who saw an opportunity for using materials and uh, that the wasn't going to be pushing it commercialization, and then they sort of developed a, a, a lot of research around that. So part of the big idea here came from recognizing that this is an opportunity that the company that they worked for was not recognized. Right, as a large company, you legitimately have to have very large businesses. Right. And so as a small company, you can start with businesses that are much smaller and they're attractive. Right. And so there's an opportunity there for sure. And that's how the company Right. Started. And as you said, time scale is different, but right. small companies can take other Yes, but Mike came out of my PhD thesis research. Uh, but more sciencey, if that's what you're getting, what you're getting at as well. We brew protein in the form of bacteria. We make delicious cheeses, hamburgers, protein bars, RTDs. I mean, we eat dead bacteria. You can put it right out there. In your face, dead bacteria. You know, humans eat plants, but they don't eat exclusively plants. Uh, you have amazing herbivores like the gorilla. How does the gorilla get so jacked off of eating just vegetables as a fat? Not eat enough essential nutrition in order to be what it is. It's loving around a big anaerobic fermenter. So we went to the real fundamentals of asking the question what are the essences of nutrition? Plants are a component of it. Humans are not autotrophs. You can't just inhale CO2 and hydrogen and grow off of it. You eat something, plants do other space, though nature's best vegans that support the herbivore, which cures what you want to eat the flesh of, we want to drink the milk of. All of that nutrition comes from the bacteria in its gut. The microbiome. The microbiome is the world's best vegan. It does the best job of converting low value plant, crappy plant protein by consuming the energy of the carbohydrates into high value protein in the form of growing in cells. And so we found nature's best bacteria protein source, 80 plus percent protein loaded with B vitamins, 
instead of letting the gorilla bruise in its gut, we took it out and we put it in massive beer fermenters that put the dogfish head in shame. And we grow bacteria to control fermentation that purified it, making them delicious foods. So we studied the essence of nutrition. Now humans have evolved to be degenerates because bacteria serve us. But in each case, you're trying to ask the fundamental question in your field, finding opportunities within that answer. And, and yeah, and each of us is saying, how is it better from the very beginning? You have to have a thesis of how is it better than the way we're doing it now? Right? Emily, did you have a question? Yeah, so I just wanted to, so for folks who were here from the beginning, we have put this um, word cloud up. This is a living document, so if you would like to um, contribute to this, you're more than welcome to. Um, but I just want to put this up here and see if our panelists have any kind of gut reactions um, to any of these words. In, in my mind, these words of survival and challenge. Um, I found it really interesting. I just didn't know if you had your own one word that comes to mind when you think of green tech. Um, or if any of these in particular stuck out to you. And feel free to use the question. Or thought. Yeah. <laughs> I think time is the one that is not up there, but the one that strikes me because it's every discussion I have is how we don't have enough time. We're behind in the time scale. We wanted to be further ahead. And then the other one you get from investors is if I gave you twice as much money, what could you do to make this technology go much faster or make the adoption go much faster? There's this this real sense that we, you know, and then how long is it going to take to develop that time is always at the center of so the yeah. yeah. I would say resilience. It's kind of cliche right now because everybody like says resilience with COVID, but before that, resilience is really important to have what you're doing to be resistant to changes, shifts in views and attitudes, and resilient approach. The word that comes to my mind is efficiency. I think that really is all about finding better ways to do the things with whatever we already have. Thank you all. We do have another comment and question in the chat. So, um, individuals that you all the companies are incredibly creative and sustainable. Congrats on your progress. Um, what barriers are you finding in mainstreaming your products and services in consumer and commercial markets? Okay. Nobody knows about the need of bacteria other than needing to go by others. So it's educating the consumer as to what that ingredient is. For us, it's the skepticism around uh, clean, clean tech 2.0. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of hype about the hydrogen 10 years ago. A lot of the startups failed. So there's still a lot of, a lot of resistance. Uh, but that's changing quite rapidly. That, that I would say that is a big, a big hurdle that we're Facing, but he's very frequently he's facing. I would say for us, it's, it's, it's a double edged sword. It's great that people are paying attention to um, carbon capture. It's our technology that's the furthest out. And so I would love to be able to use that energy and pivot to the one that's ready now. But you know, they want, we want that cool one over here. Like this, this would have so much impact and you make more money, but we like that one over there. And so I would love to, to sort of be able to get some of that momentum that people are having into sort of the practical things that you do now and not just what they're going to do in 2030, right? It's great that everyone has a roadmap to 2025, 2030, 2040, 2050. What can you do right now, even if it's not quite as cool as the 2030? But what the vision of where are Oh, exactly. It's the first step on Earth. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so Nick Bernard, second year with an MBA. Um, one of the things I feel or notice, depending on whether it's real or not, is there is a lot of enthusiasm, as you were saying, Santiago, at the moment, minds are changing. There's a lot more money being poured into Clean Tech 2.0, if you want to call it that. Is there a fear that there is maybe too much enthusiasm and maybe money, too much money compared to the opportunity and money going in places where it shouldn't go, potentially leading to some companies that are going to fail at some point are going to bring down the wave of insect 2.0. Is that a worry? And how do you, as you know, presumably all you know, good business model, protect yourself from, from that crushing of the wave? I think 
think there are two questions because it's an interesting system question, but then there's an individual company question. But say the system one is definitely real, but I think at least for me, my agenda is about hearing my company through this, right? And, and so it's partnering with people who have capabilities and network, as Brian was talking about earlier. You know, those are the folks that we want investing with us to bring something to the table besides money, right? And that absolutely the analogy I always use is I I don't need people cheering from the stands as much as I need players on the field, right? And so what is that playing in lots of different roles, lots of different opportunities there um, to do the things that money can't do, right? Which is you know pilot trials or manufacturing or lots of other of other components. So that's the way I sort of steer our company, but I do recognize that. That may happen, but I don't have a lot of control over choices that others make. <laughs> I think it's overheated yeah. in many sectors. And I think there are like three or four major issues with that. People will pick singular bets that they really all came together and invested in because two black hole stocks in my space, one in San Francisco, one in Boston, the synthetic biology microorganism world. People are going to be available to them. Pretty confident of this. Question is, is it a realization or is it slow deaths? I hope there's slow deaths, um, but that's a challenge. And also, to Erica's point, a lot of these investments aren't as gains that are sexy for 20, 30, you know, shooting more people off in space. But what about today? Like, why can't we raise the necessary capital to build something today to start helping feed people tomorrow as opposed to the hope and promise of the future? Which a lot of investors are looking for early stage hype. Not necessarily putting money in the capital to the ground of the technology. It's a major issue, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and thirdly, is it's fact, I think, is creating awareness in this moment. Zero awareness. In my space, two companies have done IPOs collectively now they're valued at 25 billion on the market. They have zero revenue or effectively zero revenue. They told investors it'll be five years before we have revenue. That's I think there's some real strange weirdness out there. We need to kind of take a pause and reboot and think about these sort of things. So, just there's a follow up to that, if there, if those investments go south, if there's some kind of collapse, that has implications for everyone else. Uh, but I hope it's a slow death. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a catastrophic. Which can put things into winterization because then the fallout is those others that are generating that space who may, to Erica's point, didn't sex it up to oversell it on that field, but rather are marching towards something diligently with capable milestones in the near term, doing so much of the market validation and the capital and the piloting and the demonstrations up and so forth. All of a sudden, that Compromise all of our capabilities, right? Right. So this goes back to your point about resilience. Just you said the thing about the strategics are helpful in that regard. You know, interacting with the funds who have gone through the FinTech 1.0 and have some sobriety and know how to sustain these things better. Um, the one thing that's a caveat to that: everybody trying to boost the valuation of their company when you're as an entrepreneur. That's what. I want to be a unicorn, right? I don't want to. I don't want to be a unicorn. I really don't want to be a unicorn because the unicorn can't deliver. You're just all of a sudden nothing, right? And so I'd rather be, and I wish more people would prefer to diligently march through this in terms of valuations and so forth. So the caveat there being, if we have the right investors, we're not going to be able to do more valuations. It's going to be something that I think is actually important. For so I think so. I think that we do have diversity needs. The fundamental technology does it make sense? Is it a technology that is really defensible? And then finding the right investors to understand the technology and get it. Because you can get money now if you say hydrogen in many different places, but you want to find investors that will do the due diligence very technically and will drill you down and say, Does it make sense? Because then they will be aligned with you no matter what happens later. They will be aligned with you because it's interesting for their own business. Or they will be aligning you because they believe in the impact that you provide. So he's having fundamental strength in the technology, understanding the market fit, because you can have very good technology, but the market fit is too important. But then also getting the right investors in this, not just getting more people, getting more people. I think we have 
one more question. I think that should be the last question. I think for us is that. Sure. Um, thank you guys. This has been, this has been really great. Uh, I'm Asher Holman. I'm the first year at Ford and MBA, um, an investor in the space and previously generated capital. Um, I'm, I'm actually frankly a little surprised by some of the, the things that you folks have been saying, in that it goes against a lot of the trends in the broader venture capital space. Where you, you know, said, you, know, you just said that you actually want these longer diligence periods. You know, I heard you guys say that you want your investors to take a more active role in advising you on business structure or, or market. That is, you know, Tiger Capital is doing the exact opposite of that, where they're saying no diligence, just throw the money in. You know, we're not going to be on your board. We're not going to give you advice. We are just capital. And that's really the the well, broad trend in venture capital. That plays one role, right? And that's just that's. Fine if the role that you want them to play is agnostic money. If you want to move your company forward and get things done, and you want the people in your boardroom to be enabling that and not watching it, then they have to be bringing, then, then there's something to the, they're bringing something to the table out. And so they need to understand what you've got in order to have the confidence to push their chips in, their non money chips in. Right? And then you need to know what that is that they're going to do. I'm not saying there's not scenarios where you wouldn't want, like, I, you know, I can get it all done myself, I just want 10. But in the material world, in the, the world where we're trying to scale up big things that take a lot of physical infrastructure and a lot of large players, not necessarily individual consumers all the time, it creates somewhat different dynamics. Right? So all my customers, my customer list doesn't would move into the thousands. My customer list is a couple pages long, and they're all in the Fortune 500, right? So like it's a different, it's a different game. I'll give you an example of the way we're doing, for example, our series A. Mm -hmm. Developing an electrolyzer system, say for example, a carbon stool of patterns of hydrogen per day that you can put into a refinery mm -hmm. is a big undertaking. You say that, they tell me you're crazy. There's mm -hmm. companies that have been doing it for 10 years, 20 years. So then we acknowledge that and we want to be extremely strategic about that. The way we're doing it is we are doing a run that has three type of investors. One is a system integrator. So we build stacks. There's this investor is putting money, but he's also giving us the expertise and the design parameters that we build our stacks around. So then that's, for example, one. We're also trying to bring an energy company. This one is a major oil and gas. So you can kind of imagine, like, wait a second, you're making green hydrogen, but you also couple with oil and gas. It's because they have a clear interest in starting carbonizing their processes. And by integrating our green hydrogen into the oil refining, they can start carbonizing. That's, for example, the same one. And, and I'm guessing Santiago, they're going to put it in, in, in one of their facilities, which there's no other way for you to get it in there. Exactly. <laughs> because these, these players are extremely risk averse. So you want them to have a skin in the game. So they're really open and letting you put them there and then get feedback the data. And then the third one is definitely we want to have a, a player with deep pockets, but that will understand this development cycle that will take a very long time and that will be ready to help you with Series B and will be able to help you connect. So, yeah, definitely you want to have the money, but you want to have the money that will help you achieve this very long cycle. I'm going to be really blunt. Those approaches, I don't see it ever succeeding in our space. Like succeeding in the tech space, right? Like capital and cascade and uh, uh, General Atlantic and the rest of them doing these sorts of things, putting in half billion dollars in these types of entities that are waiting to see if we have success five years down the road. And this approach, this strategy has been played out for two decades already. I mean, I don't want to be really pessimistic and nasty about it. It's just, I've not seen the returns in our industries. And frankly, no one wanting to be rich and profitable, I still want to have impact for it actually come to fruition. Until those models prove out that they do in our industry, I'd much rather be on the sideline and go a different approach and raise the value. And I'd love to have a follow up conversation if you've seen the success. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Sure. So, I want to keep to our commitment to end this around 5 30. Um, so, we're going to just tie things up. I want to thank the panelists. Um, Emily and the Cafe, Dick, and um, the fund leaders at Penn for this, um, and the audience. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Uh, they were really great uh, and really moved the conversation.
uh, into new spaces. So thank you all. And um, I'd like everybody to give all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is time for our conversation now. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So again, so just to you know, after everything you said, thank you all for sticking around. Um, folks on Zoom, thank you um, for your questions and engagement. Uh, folks in the space, we encourage you to stick around and network with our panelists. Um, yeah. That's, that's it. For the people <laughs> on Zoom, do they have any way of communicating with panelists? Uh, I can keep the Zoom open and we can keep the chat open. Okay. Or um, are you comfortable with? Can you hear me? Yeah. And I do know, um, by the way, that, some, that uh, at least two of the companies are looking for people. Yes, we're hiring. If you're an engineer or you like marketing and commercialization, yeah, we're not. Are you doing it all with bacteria? <laughs> <laughs> and and as long as people are here, um, question for the, the panel. What question would you expect to see, or how would you expect this panel to be in five years from now? What would you look for on, on a panel like this? Reporting on your success. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So five years from now, we're going to have reports or bursting sessions in the lab. All right. Thank you so much.